This is Marcy Davis, and I am here with Robert Mickelson. We are um, going to discuss his recent life in his, I guess, your collaborative life, and all the ways that it has impacted your artistic life, and I suppose your your social life, and it's just part of a community. It's amazing. So I don't want you to start at the beginning, but you can start with DFO and tell me a little bit about what the DFO is to you and to the um, the functional glass community. Well, the picture you're looking at here uh, was taken at the DFO 2018. Um, and uh, I'm working on a collaborative piece with uh, Scotty Mickle. Uh, he is at Liquid Glass Arts. And uh, it's one of Scotty's geometric constructions. And we have chosen a natural nature theme uh, so it's covered with uh, leaves and flowers and bugs and birds and chameleons and frogs and various other creatures. Um, you can't really see the details of it from this photo because the photo is a little fuzzy. If you want to go on my Instagram feed, uh, the, I've got some great photos of it uh, there. You have to go back to uh, summer of 2018, which is back a little ways but not too far. Uh, to see this piece. Uh, it's currently owned by a company called The Glass Factory in Gainesville, Florida. If you wanted to get a uh, clear look at it or see it firsthand, if you're in the North Florida area, you know, go to Gainesville, stop by The Glass Factory and uh, check it out. Um, I really love the DFO. I've been probably four or five times since its inception. I haven't gone to every one. Uh, but I really enjoyed this particular one last year. Uh, because they did away with the competition format and just made it uh, kind of a community event where everybody had a great time. There were no rules. You could bring whatever you want, do whatever kind of work you wanted. And I really like that loose format, very casual um, approach. And I think uh, some really terrific work came out of that uh, show. Uh, Lacey and Emily made a fantastic piece. And uh, Yushin and Rhino made an incredible piece. and uh, Or maybe it was Yushin and Kong. Now I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, uh, there was just some terrific work. Oh, oh, Banjo and Salt made a fabulous piece. Oh, and so some really incredible team. work. Yeah, really some incredible work came out of the whole thing. And uh, I was really uh, honored to be uh, a part of it all. And so it looks to me like you're using a hand torch to try to get those little elements in there. It looks kind of cry crowded in there. Well, yeah, exactly. I think our method of construction for this and for most things is to start with a kind of a an armature infrastructure and then add stuff on the top of it. So the piece is kept hot. It's on a handle in the kiln, staying staying hot while we prepare the the. Uh, item to go to be added and then we bring it out and add it on brace it up and polish the welds and we just keep building and building and building that way um, that kind of construction is pretty much the way most complex uh, collaborations are done the kiln keeps the piece hot and alive while you know numerous small operations are performed on the piece uh, to, you know until it's complete and you know tiny what? torches are integral to that. I'm using a little smith with a hornet tip here. Wow. I, I think it just occurred to me, um, furnace work always has a dance between the, the players. And there's this sort of choreography about the way people work together and anticipate each other's moves. And flame work typically, as a, you know, as a uh, solitary pursuit, does not contain that. But when you're doing these collaborations, it's back again, is it? About uh, a little bit of a dance of everybody working together to accomplish you know, the birth of the piece successfully. Um, so that's kind of, I, I never really thought about that, that element returning in the collaborative format. But when it comes to something like this, is it like, okay, I'm going to make all the flowers, you make all the leaves, or like, how does one, you know, delegate? each person's part um, by mutual agreement each of us decides what our skills are best used for and uh, mm -hmm. we just contribute you know the best we can one of the key issues about any collaboration is to you know check your ego at the door uh, <laughs> there is no overriding boss in a true collaboration everybody is an equal partner 
And so you have many chiefs and no warriors. <laughs> well, we're all chiefs and warriors, I guess. Uh, but I learned that um, I am particularly good, I believe, at doing this sort of construction, this sort of collaboration. I don't mind um, being relegated to parts making. It doesn't seem to bother me. Or if I'm called upon to do major construction moves, I can do that too. I just want to fit in wherever possible, the ultimate goal being you know, the finished piece. As far as the dance is concerned, well, yeah, boy, there's absolutely a dance. It's maybe not as coordinated most times around the single event because of the way flame working is normally done, you normally have one person working on the object at a time. And every once in a while, you might get two. Uh, the exception would be uh, when I'm working with the subliminal crew and working on one of these large guns. Um, but I'll get to that in a minute. For Scotty and my piece, you know, we took turns doing each of the tasks. And uh, the division of labor was right at 50-50, quite honestly. We both worked very, very hard for you know, a considerable period of time to build this piece. And some of the parts are his, some of the parts are mine. Uh, it, we didn't really make it end-to-end -end working on it alone, but if we had, it would have taken the two of us at least a week of full work days in order to build this piece. It was quite involved. There's a lot of uh, experimentation. There were a few setbacks. You know, there always are. and Those types of things just have to be taken as part of the process. Well, it's a, it's a great shot. It looks like a beautiful piece, and um, I'm sure it's functional, although would anybody <laughs> some of these fancy functional pieces are they ever actually used or um oh yeah absolutely they... um i think that uh i think that the use of the piece is very important people at, at least the really large collector's piece they need to smoke out of them at least once <laughs> you know i think the bigger and more elaborate it is the less practical it is you know for everyday use but um, we definitely design them with use in mind. I think that's an important qualification to be a part of this community and a part of um, this whole culture is to make sure that the function includes uh, the ability to smoke effectively out of the piece. What you smoke doesn't matter to me in the least, but it just should be you should be able to use it. And so these pieces are uh, um, definitely... Uh, designed to be used and uh, I mean for me the aesthetic has always come first but I'm very much concerned with uh, a, a good quality function as well. So I never thought about this before but is it a tradition that when all of the um, all the artists who collaborated on a huge piece like this instead of opening a bottle of champagne to celebrate do you do you pass it around and break it in or you know? No, no we don't. Um, we prefer champagne <laughs> or beer. No, no, uh, we do function tests. We can tell how it's going to work simply by putting water in it, but we don't uh -huh. want to dirty it up. Every time you use a piece like this, if you use it with uh, any kind of substance, you're going to get uh, residue and material on the inside, and you can clean, if you don't wait too long, you can clean it out pretty effectively with 91% uh, uh, isopropyl alcohol, yeah. Or refire it and get it pretty much back to pristine, but we don't. But like to no, <laughs> who wants to risk that? I wouldn't want to. No. Okay, no, we don't. We don't. We don't generally do that, and I'm not a smoker anyway, so you know. <laughs> well, that's true. Makes you sleepy, I know. So here we go. Let's go on to um, another image that I actually really loved here, which is, you know. Robert yeah, and the Wasp. Sounds that piece like was taken at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, uh, summer of 2018. Um, I'm making one of my wasps here. The, the, the piece is a, it's hollow, uh, made of all color, coil pots and blowouts, and the wings are networked. And um, I built it uh, for their auction. They have an auction every year, and so this was my auction entry. I made a little stand for it to, to fly on. I wanted to make a wasp that looked like it was flying. And uh, see, the, the, the legs are only half done there. They're actually quite a bit longer than, than that. And mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm doing there. I've made uh, half a dozen of these wasps, and uh, these large wasps are a fun construction, make a good demonstration. Uh, it goes back uh, a number of years that I've been, that I've been making them.
It's just the way. I love the wings. Yeah, the wings are done with networking. I've done a lot of different ways, just this particular one. I, and actually, wait a minute. I have to take that back. I did not make those wings. Lisa Demigal did. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it is a collaboration. <laughs> Yeah, Lisa Demagog, she was my uh, TA. She's been my TA for like seven years up there. And uh, she's quite good at uh, at uh, uh, networking, and so she built those wings, and I just added them on to my wasp. So uh, what determines um, just even the idea of doing a collab with you know certain artists? Is it just that you want to work together, or is it often because there's some sort of a charitable, you know, um, organization? Is it going to be a donation or it's an you know auction donation? What what is it? Or is it just that you want to work with certain people, so you come up with a, an idea, or all of the above? All of the above. There's lots of different reasons to do collaborations. I think the driving force behind most collaborations is the first thing you said that the artists just want to work together. Mm -hmm. um, I think the people that do collaborations eventually learn that you end up doing work and going places that you would not otherwise. And for me, that's a great adventure. Um, most of the collaborations have been tremendously rewarding learning experiences for me. I, uh, I really enjoy pushing boundaries and trying stuff that uh, I have never done before. And collaborations almost always end up to be precisely that. You work mm -hmm. really, really hard. You come up with an idea. It seems totally outrageous. You never would have tried it on your own. And then you go out and you do it and you pull it off. And, and uh, it's very rewarding that way. I really enjoy collaborations. They're one of my favorite things of all to do. I bet. And, and you know, I think it's it looks like such fun, but also very, very technically challenging. Um, well, they certainly can be. The, uh, the technical challenges are usually off the chain because you're neither one of you are working really in your comfort zone. You're uh, trying things and coordinating things with somebody that you you may not know all that well, and uh, so it's quite the dance. I, I I think that if two people were to collaborate and then work together repeatedly and then again and again and again, they could probably smooth out the bumps. But most times it's just one time, one shot. So there's plenty of bumps, plenty of things go wrong, and you have to be willing to roll with that. Uh, you know that is something that. Uh, my crew and the subliminal crew working together on these guns has learned that bad stuff happens and you have to be willing to roll with the punches because there's no avoiding it. There just is no way to avoid it. You have to count on bad things happening and happening at a time which is which you can't anticipate and it's never, you know, at a good time. Is there any particular um color that you prefer and I mean as far as a manufacturer there's so many choices now or do you just use everybody's I use everybody's and it depends on what I'm doing and my preferences vary from time to time um, I think that for the longest time there were no quality transparent colors in borosilicate glass and just in the last few years that's changed and now there's tremendously beautiful jewel-like uh, Transparent colors, so the, the 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 likes of which uh, you know you used to see uh, you're used to seeing in in Moretti, uh, and right. now they're available in borosilicate, and uh, that mm -hmm. made them my favorite colors. Also the um, the bright primary colors, the blacks, the whites, reds, yellows, blues are all getting much 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 better, and cleaner and brighter and denser, and uh, that's also so I I really like working with the really strong strong colors. I, I think in the future what you're going to see is the palette um, sort of level out to where all the colors are going to have this uh, really, uh, really, really, really high quality, pure, homogenous consistency, beautiful transparency. The, the bar is being raised right now by all of the color companies such that uh, the borosilicate glass, which for so long had to take a back seat to soft glass, it just isn't going to anymore. It just isn't. They're, the color quality is going to be just as good. Did the recent uh, political climate and the tariffs make the availability or pricing of the Chinese boro, um, you know, difficult to get, or did it not? Did you not really see any difference in that? I have not noticed a difference. 
in the Chinese colors, mostly because I don't buy them very much. Wow. There is a strong pushback uh, against Chinese products, uh, especially in the functional side of this industry. I think a lot of people who are not working in the functional industry like their glass just fine. And my own personal feeling is there's not really anything wrong with the Chinese colors. They're just very limited in their scope. There's really only about 10 colors that they make. There just mm -hmm. aren't very many of them. They're mostly transparent. They're making them in enormous batches. So they don't really spend a lot of time developing new colors. They just mm -hmm. sell the heck out of these, uh, out of the 10 existing colors that they do. Uh, they're quite good quality. Their transparents are very, very good. Uh, but uh, like I say, again, um, there's, there's pushback. People really uh, don't want to buy objects made of Chinese glass. And it's, a, it's definitely, a, I guess you wouldn't say it's a boycott, but uh, there's definitely a pushback. So I've taken to avoiding them and buying only American colors. I think that's awesome, and that you know that was my next question, which is so then as a community, because there's there's so much about that sort of um, functional community or you know real family, and uh, there seems to be a real social sense on so many levels as far as what's responsible, what's what's good for people, what's good for um, you know like just look at all the charitable acts and things like that that are done. So I think I think that's interesting. I'm glad we talked about that. I so love now. the charity events myself. Um, I've, I've been to several here in the past couple of years. The Michigan Project's probably my favorite one, but we've also been to the Armadillo Initiative. And uh, I, I like doing them. It's, uh, the, the feeling of community is just as you say. It's very strong, and I feel like um, our medium and the, the, the breadth of our community is uh, perfect for uh, doing that sort of thing. And so, as you just mentioned, you know, the Michigan Project, et cetera, what does each one contribute to? What, what are their, um, you know, charitable efforts? Where, where, where is that uh, going? Now you're going to pin me down. Um, Sorry, hey, never mind. You, yeah, you should, you should go to check out the Michigan Project and the Armadillo Initiative itself. The Armadillo Initiative, I think, is for Meals for Wheels, and I think the Michigan Project is uh, art programs for children in public schools. That's... Don't Armadillo quote me on that. Initi like that. Initiative, did you say? Yeah, the Armadillo Initiative in uh, Austin, Texas, every year, and I think that Meals for Wheels is their is their charity. That's that's so wonderful. Um, you know, it's like there's art, and there's art for art's sake, and then there's art for everybody's sake. I just think that's fabulous. So, um, now I have. Whoops, I don't. I want you to hit play, but. Um, we have a couple. I was so thrilled when you sent me these little, you know, little video clips. Is this from your most recent um, project? Yes, it is. This is from the uh, recent uh, Weapons of Peace Art of War project that I am, I and my crew at Mickelson Studios um, are making with the Subliminal Glass and their crew from uh, Vancouver, Washington. And they flew, they've flown out here now several times to make projects with us. This is just the latest one. Uh, this is uh, Christian and Ryan pulling a piece uh, that we're working on. This is the Shogun out of the kiln, and Patrick's getting ready to, looks like he's going to fix a little crack in the framework of the piece. So it's, that's what he's using, his mini torch. And over here on the back, that looks like, yeah, that's, that's Reed Jones, and he is not going to do anything. He is just sizing up the next move. So two things are going on here at once. While uh, Patrick fixes a check, Ryan and Christian are handling the movement around of the piece. Reed is sizing up and getting ready to make the next move, which is the trigger and the trigger guard. You get a little better look at him sizing up the trigger guard here. He has to trim it and get it to where it fits right in the spot where it's supposed to go. So that's what he's, he's sort of eyeballing it. And you can see here there's four people working on this piece at once, which is not the traditional way of doing flame working. And uh, uh, that's where I think that uh, our collaborations tend to be much more involved because they're, they're, they're so difficult to do that really requ requires a coordinated effort by four people. So Ryan and Christian have flipped the piece over. The, ha the handle is made of glass, and the piece is so heavy that we don't trust the handle, so that's why Christian's got the gloves on. He's like a spotter. He's supporting the weight while Ryan does the maneuvering of the piece. 
and then uh, now they're getting ready to put it back in the kiln because they're done with their operation. Each time they take it out of the kiln, you've only got a couple of minutes. And uh, somebody's watching the clock and making sure, you know, that we don't have it out for too long. So if that's what was going on in that simple video. <laughs> you, the, the, the process went on it's for fabulous. days and days and days. How, how long were you working on that? Uh, we worked on it in two stages. The first stage was last January. Uh, we attempted to make four of these guns in a two-week period and only got two of them done and then part finished on the Shogun and the next rifle which is not done uh, which no one has seen yet. Uh, this time they came out and they were here for a week and we worked on this gun. It took us a week to finish it when we had almost all the parts made because there were setbacks and difficulties. Um, this wow. is a this image is taken or this film is taken a little further along in the process and you can see that the, the, the front bayonet has been added, the Oni head sight and the scope have all been added. Uh, the trigger guard and trigger are on. That's Reed Jones and um, Patrick working on the back end. Now, I have to just say here, you may wonder why you never see me in any of these videos. That's because I'm always the one taking the videos. No one ever took videos of me working, but trust me, I work just as hard as these guys did. <laughs> That's uh, Kyle there in the background. He's taking videos, posting. You know, social media is very important, so we're trying to maintain awareness. So anyway, there are, I, I've got dozens of videos like it's, it's, this, working on the process and you know, <laughs> sort of documenting the process, the very slow, tedious process of putting these gigantic pieces together. This piece ended up being 42 inches long, and I think we have finished product uh, oh my coming up God. here later on in this talk. Yeah, yeah, we, we totally do. Um, do you frequently have little checks and cracks and things? I mean, I think it would be pretty unavoidable, really. It's unavoidable. It's, it's absolutely unavoidable. We are asking a lot of the material in making these things. This is a huge ask. The material uh, objects, obviously, and when it objects, we have to appease it, fix it. <laughs> Say, let's see, this one, this is another very short video, just bear with us, it's only a 25 seconds long, but you can see now we've added the back handle, and you get an idea of how long this piece is, and it's all held on that one glass tube. You see the color, that's actually a bright cherry red, but it's hot, so the color is actually dark, which is typical of uh, those cadmium colors. I think we're coming down the home stretch here at this stage of the game, it's late at night, Everybody's exhausted. Everything's on the line. Every time we take that piece out of the kiln, it's a huge risk. The thing could end up on the floor, and we would lose all that work. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. All right, well, here, this is the part I've been waiting for. This is the finished product. We've, it, it, we've had it out of the kiln and gilded and cleaned up. It's been, it's been completed for about one hour at the, at the time that this video was made. Let me start it here. And this is just a walk around. This is just a walk around of the piece. You can see the gilding there and the, and the bright red color now that the piece is cold. The color is bright red. All that gilding is uh, resist sandblasted into the side of the gun. And then very carefully the gilding is added, fired, and then the edges are cleaned up so that it makes a nice crisp image. All the writing is uh, legitimate. There's things like... Uh, the name of the sword maker and the, the Bushido code and a number of other things. It's not just random Chinese characters. Hardly breathe. Okay, it's that blows my mind. And you know, I'm pretty jaded. I've seen like everything. The the complexity, the beauty, everything about it. It's that is a well, gorgeous thing. Here, let me. I have an image of it in its entirety. Like the entire hell. thing. Quite honestly, I've never been involved with anything quite like this. And I have to hand it off to uh, Patrick McDougall of Subliminal Glass for convincing me that such projects are doable. I always avoided things this large, this complex, and this difficult because of the extremely high price point that would result. But what's happened with uh, the two crews is that we've managed to sell every rifle we've made so far. The only one that's still available is this one that we just finished. So with that kind of a track record, it's pretty hard to uh, to say no. 
Uh, <laughs> this particular one is still very new at the time you and I are talking. It's only been done for um, about not even quite a month. Not even quite a month. We took it up to Glass Roots and showed it there, and it looked fantastic. We got a lot of feedback. Um, well, we're very, very proud of it, and we think that uh, it will sell. We think that someone will pick it up. We have a very generous wholesale ask for it, but we'll just see what happens. <laughs> and and so these, uh, what is it, Weapons of Peace? Is that, is that uh, our Weapons of Peace is the series of glass weapon, uh, functional glass weapon pipes that I've been doing for seven years now. Uh, this particular part of the series we are calling the Art of War. There are four <laughs> pieces, each of Perfect. them based... Each of them based on uh, an ancient culture that was known both for its art and its war. And the cultures that we picked were Viking, Egyptian, Samurai, which you see here, and then one that's still in the works that is Aztec. And so uh, the Art of War series, right, that's what we're doing. Um, this particular one is, I, I can't take my eyes off it either, to be honest, Marcy. It's so beautiful and so stunning. Uh, it's really uh, I'm still amazed that we pulled this off. Eight people, 600 man hours, probably all told. Uh, it's 42 inches long. It's a beast. It's a what? scale of an actual sniper rifle. What does it weigh? Uh, there's a good question. I don't know. Gla <clears throat> borosilicate glass is notoriously lightweight, so probably weighs under five pounds, but it's no. still a hefty beast. It's still a hefty beast. Uh, for borosilicate glass. I would have guessed like 15 or 20, maybe if it was uh, less. Oh, no, no. Well, it, it may be, no, it's, it's nothing like that. It's, uh, but it's, by our standards, it is a hefty beast. And so when did you, like how did you get the idea for this Weapons of Peace? You, what, where did it you know, stem from in your, in your brilliance there? When did that happen? You mean the whole Weapons of Peace series? Yeah, like like when did you come up? Gee, I think I'll make guns. I mean, when, how did this yeah, well, begin? Uh, I can I can start by telling you that uh, I am not a gun enthusiast. I'm not right. a gun person. I don't collect guns. I have learned. I've gone out and shot them so that I would further my understanding of them. But I'm not a gun person at all. I really don't like guns. But my interest in them had to do with um, noticing how. Guns were such a pervasive part of our society, and so many of my friends, people that I was associated with, carried guns casually in the glove compartments of their cars, in their homes, you know. Uh, and I wanted to know what the deal was. So when I started looking into them, the first thing I noticed was that, like other weapons that humans have made since the beginning of, you know, civilization, guns are made to be beautiful. They have a very definite aesthetic. It's an uh, architectural aesthetic. Uh, form follows function very much like buildings or cars, but it, they're definitely beautiful. And uh, what started this off was me thinking, well, this must say something about human nature, that the, the art and the, and the war are like two sides of a coin. They, are, they describe us as a species, but you really can't have one without the other. So I decided I was going to portray the art side of it here and do away with the war and death side of it and just leave that, just play that part up. It's a kind of a counterbalance to the uh, cultural fascination that we have with these weapons of death. So it's just my, my, my take on it. It's been very successful. Um, I've, you know had re very strong responses from people who have encountered my series. At first they're confused, but when I explain my viewpoint, they understand. I've had the experience of having uh, two people with opposite political views standing in front of one of my pieces, and they both come together to admire you know, the work of art. Uh, so I think it's been a, a fulfilling series. Um, I can tell you that it's a little different between Patrick McDougall and uh, of Subliminal Glass and myself, where I am not a gun person. Patrick is. <laughs> so the two of us actually working on these series come from kind of opposite ends of the of the gun issue. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all that it's very interesting. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it, to it totally did. And I'm, I'm still, you know, I, I can't stop looking at this image. It just blows my mind left and right. So um, you have the the Aztec one still, is that the one that is still yeah, in process? Yeah, there's still an Aztec-themed weapon that I don't really want to talk about. Because, okay. Uh, 
um, I mean, I, I want it to be a surprise the way this one was. There's one more coming. You have no idea what's the guy. It's going to be spectacular, and and Yay. you know every bit as spectacular as this one, but it probably won't come until uh, to the end of the year or just after. So, is there anything you would like to add to our little discussion here? Um, I'm, you know, inspired, especially about what you just shared, as far as um, focusing on the art. As a matter of fact, if you ever get a chance, like every every year when I go to Laos, we spend a day over at Coburg Castle, Vesta Coburg, and they have this whole room of ancient firearms with those scenes of semi-precious stones inlaid gorgeous hunting scenes and this and that they are so undeniably art they're they're no matter how you feel about you know about weapons you cannot get away from the actual i don't know what the, the human celebration of of talent within the scenes of of these firearms it's you, know, you never really Except think of that. But the only true. difference is that those are real firearms, and that's yes. not what we're making. <laughs> Still, I do understand. I've been to the, I've been to the, you know, the, in, into uh, museums like the uh, Chicago Art Institute, where they have entire wing devoted to uh, weapons and armor and such. Mm -hmm. That are, it's just spectacular to walk through those places and see the incredibly beautiful artwork that's done on these weapons. Yeah, it's truly unbelievable. Well, listen, everybody, um, be on the lookout for Glass Art Magazine. We're going to be having um, an article that will be made from this wonderful interview all about Robert Mickelson's uh, Weapons of Peace, especially, you know, specifically this Shogun project. So, Robert, thank you so much for your time and your talent and everything you've brought to the industry. And, uh, you know, thank you so much and uh, see you next time. All right. It's my pleasure, Marcy. Good talking to you.